Chapter 13 Two days later, the blessed and two dozen soldiers reached the farthest village. They reined in their horses in the village square, and Adeline pushed back her hood. They're dead already, she whispered in horror. The rest of them equally downtrodden and upset. Fidelius took the path of leadership. Get down and split up. Make sure not to touch your faces after handling the dead. Pile the dead in the middle of the square. And if there is someone alive who can identify them, write their names down, please. He pointed to two men. Butcher the chickens so the princess can make broth. Blessed, you look for survivors. Adeline couldn't help the tears that started as she opened her mind and searched for the weak and sickly. Following her mind, she found people choking on their phlegm. Owen with her. By the end of a long, long day, a huge pile of bodies lay in the middle of the square. Celine stood at its head. Those who had been unaffected, or only lightly affected by the plague, encircled them. Celine had never been a great person at dealing with emotions, but unfortunately was the only member whose energies were not completely drained. She was the only one currently standing unaided and without looking haunted. Adeline and Eblin were both red-eyed from weeping, while Aubrey and Njal looked grim and angry. So Celine stood alone and lifted her hands. God of death, he who is merciful and genteel, we pray you receive these souls who have been taken too soon from us and show them to paradise. Please grant us the ability to recover from their abrupt passing, the ability to accept what we cannot change, and the strength to band together and unite in this dark time. So let it be. In your name we pray and honor the dead. In your name we pray. All surrounding the dead echoed her as she spread her palms wide and set the bodies aflame. The blaze was so high it seemed to lick the skies, and Celine lowered her hands, sadness trickling a single hot tear down her cheek. That night, they scrubbed themselves down in vinegar water, and then rinsed in hot water heated by Celine. They slept under the stars outside of the village in one of the tents they had previously used coming to Westholt. The blessed remained for two days to ensure the recovery process was well on its way. However, Adeline was hopeful that with the information and spells she had taught the village healer, that whoever was left would survive. They rode on, and repeated the same pattern in villages all over the north, slowly working their way back to the capital. They rode into the courtyard and tumbled from their horses. They looked awful. No one had had a proper regular soap and water bath in weeks. The constant travel was making them stiff and sore, and the drain on their powers was making them lose weight. Adeline could sense dire need for her in the infirmary, so she made her way there, letting the others take their belongings to the cottages, and continued without rest. Mother, what do you need? Adeline asked when Isadora appeared in the infirmary. A delicate kerchief pressed to her nose. She was proud of the strong will that was with this child of hers, the power and compassion. However, at this moment, she looked scared and completely defeated. You need to come to the royal quarters. Willard has caught the plague. Adeline's face took on a look of tired horror, and then resignation. She left Evelyn, Njal, and Aubrey in the infirmary. Celine was burning corpses and praying, once again, to the god of death. She had done it took much in the short period of time since the beginning of the plague. Numbly, Adeline picked up her bag and followed her mother up the stairs to the royal suites. Everywhere she looked, there was death and decay. Everywhere she walked, death accompanied her like a faithful old friend. She was tired of death. As they walked, Isadora filled her in. They had separated into households a day away in the city, but Willard had remained with their father at the palace. At the news of his illness, but Freya and Isidora had rushed back. Freya was desperately hoping that her son would be okay. Adeline didn't even acknowledge her family that was in the room as she bent over and looked down at her brother. Freya was pressing a cloth to the brow of her son. His ash-gray face and cracking lip broke Adeline's heart. He was not coughing up black tar, and that was a bad sign. Clear the room or be quiet, Adeline wearily began her ritual. She stoked the fire high and turned down the lights, then surrounded her brother in a ring of salt from her bag. No one had left as she knelt in front of the fire to close her eyes and began to chant. She no longer tried to summon life. It didn't work. Instead, she reached for her brother's mind, and she bore down into it. 
When her spirit feet hit the ground, she looked around. Everyone was frozen in time. Her father, holding his first wife tenderly as they watched their son. Her mother, with tears on her cheeks. And her own body. She turned to her brother's body. Usually this would show her a sickness in the body, the target areas, but she frowned deeply as she gazed at her brother. He looked completely normal. She slowly moved towards him, trying to find how that could be, to figure out what was wrong with him. As she stood over him, she felt rather than saw another presence. She looked up to see a man of nightmares. He was out of the darkness, and darkness was out of him. She could feel the power coming off him, like poison oozing across the floor to her brother. She placed a hand on Willard's arm. I won't let you take him. I'm afraid, my dear, you simply don't have a choice. Look at my power. I am barely tired, and I have laid this land to waste. You, however, are exhausted and close to death. You will not outlast me. I have been held to Westholt and the Northlands, for now. Soon enough, we'll take over the rest of the North and collapse it into ruin. He circled her and her brother, clumsy in his walking, as if he was unused to his body. You could have this power too, if you chose it, Adeline. Hot tears dripped down her face as she stared down at Willard's body and watched it begin to waste. She put her fist into her mouth to muffle her sobs. He was behind her now, and she felt all the hairs on the back of her neck stand up as he leaned over her, getting too close. This could all be yours, Adeline. The power of life over death. You can save him. He took her hand, and she felt the heady power pulsating through it and into her gut. Her eyes closed. All the nightmares, the mental anguish of your powers will be gone. All you have to do is vow yourself to him. She shuddered, moaning in pain. Who is him? She wrapped himself, or he wrapped himself around her and forced her to watch. She whimpered as she saw the darkness plummet to an even harsher depth. There was no face, not yet, just the presence of a god she did not want to see. No! No, I won't go with him! She struggled to pull away, but the man behind her grabbed her cheeks, forcing her to remain staring at the god and then down at her brother. You could save Willard right now without even a blink if you vow to serve him. Otherwise, who knows if you'll be able to save him with your own powers? He hissed in her ear. You aren't strong enough, Adeline. You are weak. Too weak to be able to fight by yourself! The others you call blessed know it, and that's why they don't ask you to ever do anything but heal. You aren't as strong as they are, and they know it. Accept it. They don't respect you. She knew he was right. Had known it for so long, there was a reason they never included her in physical mock battles. She never thought it was because they thought of her as weak. But of course, they must think that she wasn't strong like they were. Perhaps she should become stronger. Healing was her only element, her only power. Maybe she should add on a little bit. It wouldn't hurt that much. She could feel her hand lifting, reaching out. Just as she nearly touched it, a snarl of light ripped the darkness from her, and a harsh voice blasted into her mind. You are mine. She was slammed back into her own body with a scream. She spun around on her knees to look at her brother, expecting him to be in the darkness. But he was now breathing normally, with no coughing and no fever. Adeline smiled softly, swaying in the spot, her mind losing the ability to be awake, and she hit the ground. The last thing she remembered was the cry of her name. She woke up in the bed in the ga gameskeeper's cottage, and it was, for the first time in weeks, comfortable and warm and thankfully clean. She was wedged close to a warm body. She rolled her head back to see that it was Njal spooning her from behind, wrapping her up in a gentle bear hug. She smiled and returned to facing a sleeping Eblin, and she fell back asleep. 
All six blessed slept for three days. When they woke, they returned to work, helping people recover. It was quite some time before Adeline could finally discuss with the blessed what had happened and who she had seen. Are you kidding me, Adeline? Selene got so hot to proclaim as they rode to the next village along the coast. We would literally be nothing without you. Thousands more would have died. Adeline shrugged. Well, yeah, but I'm useless in battles. So? We don't need more battleheads than we'd all be... Unless... Aubrey pointed out. We don't need another idiot who can swing a sword. That's what we have Selene for. Fuck you, Aubrey. Selene snarled at her, and they all laughed. We need you more the exact way you are, darling. Nial chimed at her and grinned at her. And we love you the way you are. Adeline smiled happy at him. You know why they went for you first? Evelyn told her as she brushed her hair at the sedate walk they were resting their horses at. No, why? Because you are the best one of all of us, Evelyn said. The strongest and the most power. The one who has the ability to turn thousands to her side. So in other words, the most dangerous. No, I'm not. The rest of you have an ability to fight and do more than I can. You each have your separate and different strengths. That's what makes you all stronger together. Now shut up. We're picking up the pace. But Delius interceded to stop the arguing. They were all getting tired and he wanted to push on. They had spent the few weeks trying to be as efficient as possible to help as many people as they could. Hopefully, this plague would soon be over. They arrived at the village, pleased to see everyone was healing, and they only needed a bit of help with the disposal of those infected and healing those still alive. They were just being ready to eat when Nalina entered their minds with a harsh force. Come home, Matilda's infected, was all she announced, and then she was gone. A cry came from the throat of Adeline, and she crumpled to the ground, unable to hold herself up. They had all turned very white, and a deep shudder came from the rest. Aubrey bent down to help Adeline to her feet and announced to the rest of them, We will ride in the morning. They had a stew that night. Silence hardened the air and pain in their hearts. They already knew this plague was not a normal plague. It was blessed cast, not a normal plague. So it could have killed any one of them all this time. So it could kill Matilde. They rode into the courtyard of the manor house. It was dirty from the smoke and smudging. Nalina met them in the yard, looking exhausted and gaunt. She had been keeping the plague from her land and sending energy to the blessed as much as possible. Adeline slid out of her saddle and staggered to Nalina. How is she? She asked as the others dismounted. Weak, but I need you to examine her. The cunning god isn't the same as the god of healing. Her cats were pacing, and Matilde lay flat on the bed like a corpse, pale beyond measure and barely breathing. Adeline whimpered and took her hand. She's so clammy. She closed her eyes and began to concentrate. Her power was weak, and when she reached into herself, she couldn't even feel a flicker of her power. So tired, she just wanted to rest. But then hands touched her back and borrowed energy filled her. With a deep breath, she plunged back into the now-familiar void, hunting for her friend. And despite using her strongest magic, Adeline knew. So she pulled herself back and wiped her tears away. It's as I knew with Willard. She's not actually sick. The plague has settled in her mind. It is her test whether or not she will survive, Adeline said sadly. Adeline ordered a bath and sent everyone out of the room. She lowered herself into the tub and began to sob quietly into a towel, rocking back and forth in the steaming bath. Aubrey and Evelyn went into their own rooms and settled into silence. Njal hunted down Selene and found her lying on the beach, watching the waves with a bottle of rum. He walked through the sand and sat beside her. Without speaking, he plucked the rum from her and took a drink. Do you think she'll pass her test? Nyal asked, handing back the bottle. Selene shrugged. Who knows? But I hope so. We can't do this without her. She chugged another shot. That's true, Nyal muttered. Matilde, however, wasn't concerned at all. She was wandering in the gods' lands, blissfully unaware of all the trauma her physical body was going through. It was so bright in the gods' lands, such vibrant, brilliant colors that almost made her eyes hurt. The air was tart if air could be tart, and she was wandering down a cobblestone road, 
Everything about this land was beautiful. The smells were stronger than they had ever been, the colors gleamed, and there was utter silence in her mind. It was odd. All she ever remembered was never being alone, always with an animal or later on, her blessed in her head. She came to a dying patch of land. In the middle of it sat a table for two. Mathilde stopped and she glanced around. Grapes were withered on the vine here, and it seemed to be a dry and dying land. Not really what one expected of the godslands. Would you dine with me? A whispered voice behind her could have made a regular person drop dead of a heart attack. As it was, Mathilde jumped nearly a foot high and then spun around with her hands, ready to slap. Standing there was a tall, sickly-looking older man. His eyes were wrinkled but sharp. Shades of blue-green stared at her. Everything about him seemed to ooze cunning. I beg your pardon? She assumed this could be a god she was speaking to. Would you like to dine with me? Mathilde glanced back at the dead patch. Here? Mathilde didn't think this was a nice place to eat, but when he nodded, she sat down on one side of the table while he settled on the other. With a wave of his hand, a banquet sat before them, and he took a peach and began to eat. He motioned to the rest of the food. Do you not want to eat, Mathilde? Her eyes narrowed at him. You aren't a god. It wasn't a question. He took another bite of his peach and chewed it while watching her through even more cunning. No, I am not. She nodded slowly. You are David. He stopped his chewing to watch her. Yes, I am. I heard you were dead. I was, but I have been reborn. Then why are you here? Aren't you supposed to be preparing for your god's potential return? Potential? <laughs> I think we can both agree that the one true god's return is inevitable. As inevitable as his departure. I doubt it. After all, this time it's a little different. How? In this case, it's actually worse. Last time you had only Nalina and a few gods blessed that were not on the team. Now there are seven of us. We will not allow your god to destroy the world we know and love. He studied her closely. There's no sense trying to tempt you, is there? None at all. There's nothing you could do to tempt me, or any of my blessed, to f turn from one another. Not all of you have such stalwart morals, and the one god can offer such advantages, it can be hard to resist temptation. He ignored her snort of disapproval. His elderly appearance melted away until a man of middle age, with black hair and sharp blue-green eyes, stared at her. I suppose, though, if I can't make you see reason, I need to get you out of the way. Mathilde could feel the black power of death rising. She could sense the diabolical power as he slowly stood, and she pressed the back in her chair. Her breathing became shallow. She lifted her chin to glare at him as he raised his hand, his lips forming a wicked word of death. Suddenly, Mathilde could sense she was no longer alone. A smile spread on her face, and... He frowned at her sudden happiness. I suggest that you step away from my student, David. Calm words, underscored with deep rage, came from behind her. David's eyes snapped over Mathilde's shoulder, and a start of a softer smile appeared on his face as Mathilde felt a hand press on her shoulder. She drew comfort in Nalina's presence as she stared up at the eye locked between the two. She couldn't see Nalina but she could see conflicting emotions in David's eyes, followed by the hardness of determination as she became forgotten. What makes you think I won't just kill the both of you right now? Nalina leaned closer, and suddenly a licking, pulsating power was around them. Mathilde covered Nalina's hand with her own and squeezed tight, offering her power. You don't have power here. This is God's lands, not God's lands. You are exhausted, David, from implementing the plague. I could sense your exhaustion in the last few cases. You need to gather your strength. You used the last of your strength to come here and try to bribe my student into betraying her blessed. And now that you failed, you couldn't kill anything now. David lunged towards Mathilde with curled fingers, but Nalina's staff hit him, striking him hard in the chest and sending him flying out of the de dimension with the god's limbs with the force of her power. Mathilde took a shaky breath. Well, that's that, I suppose. Nalina gave a laugh and sat across the table from Mathilde. 
The grass around them was alive. The grapes were full of juice. Nelina watched her with a gentle smile. Well, my dear, what do you think of your future home? Matilda glanced around at the paradise hesitantly. Will it really be my home? Nelina nodded at her. All blessed go to one of two places when we eventually die. We come here to be in the God's Lands, or we become constellations and can visit any of the realms we want. But the God's Lands is our rightful place. Only the best of God's blessed become constellations. Matilde nodded thoughtfully. Nalina smiled at her. Enough of that. Are you ready to return home? While Matilde was nodding, the landscape faded and she woke up, covered in sweat between sleeping cats. She smiled and rolled over, snuggling deep into her bed, wrapping an arm around her cat, and fell asleep. And Ad when Adeline stepped into the room to check on her, she wept to see Matilde in a natural sleep.